right. Well, welcome. It is Monday night and live from my basement here. And we're going to talk about three subjects as we do each week. And we're going to talk about courage, the importance of having courage, how God will help us to have more courage than we currently have. And we're going to talk about sin and we're going to talk about love. And that will wrap up the seven-week discipleship course that we've been doing here for Elevation Chapel in Newton, Massachusetts. Each week, we tackle three subjects, and you can go back anytime and to our website, elevationtoday.com, and you can watch each one of these sessions. So tonight, after I'm done here, uh, about an hour later, it will post to Facebook, uh, rather, I'm sorry, to our website. And uh, you can always rewatch the broadcast here uh, on the Facebook page. But anyways, I'm glad that you tuned in tonight. Uh, isn't it, it, it if you're in uh, Massachusetts, it was a cold and dark day. And so it's I was looking forward to spending time with all of you. Uh, it just it's so nice to just forget about how cold and dark it was outside today. It is winter. I mean, it's February. us New Englanders, that's that's just how it is. Some of you that are watching in other states and they say, uh, you've got it easy because it's, uh, you know, minus 10 below or whatever, <laughs> wherever you are. So wherever you're watching from, whether it's uh, the sunny south or the frigid north, uh, I'm just really happy that you are here tonight. Um, all right, let's get right into it. Uh, this is only about 30 to 35 minutes, so I try to go pretty fast and honor your time. Let's dive into Mark chapter 5. We're going to start in verse 21. There's really two things that uh, this story in, in Mark chapter 5 that, that focuses on that just get me so pumped about, about courage. Let's go. Put my glasses on because I need glasses now. <laughs> Jesus got into the boat again, went back to the other side of the lake where a large crowd gathered around him on the shore. Then a leader of the local synagogue, whose name was Jairus, arrived. When he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet, pleading with him. My daughter is dying, he said. Please come, lay your hands on her and heal her so that she can live. Jesus had a reputation of healing the sick. So here's this guy full of faith, full of courage, asking Jesus, will you please you know, take time out of your day and come and pray for my daughter so that she'll be well. Jesus went with him, and all the people followed, crowding around him. A woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. She had suffered a great deal from many doctors over the years, and she spent everything she had to pay for them. But she had gotten no better. I mean, can you imagine 12 years not feeling well, going to doctor after doctor and spending every cent you have and getting no better. I mean, that is, that's just going to be so heartbreaking and, and frustrate, frustrating. It says, in fact, she had gotten worse. She had heard about Jesus, so she came up behind him through the crowd, touched his robe. For she thought to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. Immediately, the bleeding stopped, and she could feel her body in her body that she had been healed of her terrible condition. Is that awesome? You know, she had the courage to press through the crowd. That took courage. That took guts. And as soon as she touched Jesus's robe, she didn't even have say, "Hey Jesus, can you turn around and pray for me?" She just believed that if with with faith, with great faith, if she could just touch his robe that she'd be healed and she felt like she was healed. Jesus realized at once that healing power had gone out from him. So he turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my robe? Isn't that powerful? His disciples said to him, Look, look at this crowd pressing all around you. How can you ask who touched me? I mean, it's a crowded street. Jesus is on his way to, to pray for this girl that's dying. And everyone's just bumping into everybody. And, and But Jesus knew somebody reached out in faith and touched him and received a miracle. So he kept on looking to see who had done it. Then a frightened woman, trembling in the realization of what had happened to her, came and fell on her knees in front of him and told him what she had done. And he said to her, isn't this beautiful? Jesus says to her, daughter, 
Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. So many times I've seen someone come into church and they and they came in suffering. They came in so hurt, uh, whether it was a sickness or, or uh, just mentally just so worn out from the challenges of life. And something about being in church, it was like them having the courage to press through all the awkwardness of going to a, a church for the first time, pressing in and saying, God, I have faith today and I need you to help me. And so many people have come to the altar afterwards crying, say, during worship, you know, my whole life it was you know, just changed in, a, in an instant. Uh, during the sermon or during a prayer or something, I've even had people downstairs afterwards in a conversation because we always have a big meal after church, pre-COVID. After COVID, we'll get back to those big meals. Can't wait. But I've even had people in conversations downstairs in the fellowship hall with one of the members from the church that had that same kind of awakening um, because somebody said something to them and it just touched their life in a powerful, transformative way. It's awesome. God can use you. So whether you're at church or you're at work or at school or even out in your neighborhood, know that God, he can work in and through you. We'll talk about that more. But let's keep going here. So he says to this woman, I love how he calls her daughter. Like, you know, you're part of the family now. You know, you're part of the family. You reached out in faith. And your faith, it's healed you. Go in peace. Your suffer, suffering is over. That really took courage. May we all have the courage to press through when we're hurting. Press into Jesus. Press into getting to know him more, just to get a little closer to Jesus. Let's keep going. Verse 35. Again, if you just joined us, we're in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 5. Now we'll pick it up in verse 35. While he was still speaking to her, messengers arrived from the home of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue, and they told him, your daughter has died. There's no use in troubling the teacher anymore. In other words, Jesus, she's dead. Thanks for offering to come to my house and pray for my daughter, but she's died. And how do you think Jesus responded? Jesus overheard them and said to Jairus, don't be afraid, just have faith. Then Jesus stopped the crowd, stopped the crowd and wouldn't let anyone go with him except Peter, James, and John. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw much commotion and weeping and wailing. He went inside and asked, why all this commotion and weeping? The child isn't dead. She's only asleep. The crowd laughed at him, but he made them all leave. Now, this is, I think, a, a little side note. Sometimes when you go to church or you tune into like a Bible study like this, Sometimes like there's the main points and then there's sometimes there's little side points. This is a little side point. So Jesus, he had the courage himself uh, to tell the people that were laughing, thinking, who does Jesus think he is? The girl is dead. We know, we saw with our own eyes, she's no longer breathing. She does not have a heartbeat anymore. And Jesus is saying, oh, don't worry, she's just sleeping. The people are like, yeah, we know better. She's definitely not alive anymore. Jesus had the courage, and I think we should learn from this, to say to those people, okay, um, you, you can't go on this next leg of the journey with me. Sometimes we're surrounded by people that make fun of our faith or make fun of God or just don't have the faith that we have. And those people can be, um, they could still be our friends. We still got to love them, but maybe they're not supposed to be with us on, on that next step of the journey where we have to, you know, trust the Lord and, and not be uh, distracted by people with no faith. So he took the girl's uh, father and mother and his three disciples into the room where she was lying, holding her hand. He said to her, Little girl, get up. And the girl, who was 12 years old, immediately stood up and walked around. Not only did she start breathing again, 
and her heart started beating again. But she got up, walked around, and they were overwhelmed and totally amazed. What did Jesus do next? He said, now get the girl something to eat. <laughs> I just, I don't know why I like that, but I just think that's great. Um, this is beautiful. So the dad, he had to have courage to press in himself to go reach Jesus. Oftentimes we try to live our lives on our own and we don't want to ask for help. And I think that Jesus is showing us picture after picture all through his stories that we're supposed to come to him, ask him for help. We're supposed to be there for each other, to, to you know, love each other and encourage one another, to grow together. Our church, we're, we exist to see people elevated and transformed by what? The love of Jesus. And the way that we could best do that is to live our lives with people and give some of our life away to people. Give our time. Give our God-given talents. Just be there for people. So Jairus, he had courage. The woman uh, who had been you know, dealing with the sickness of, of bleeding for 12 years, she had courage. What is courage? Or courageous is an adjective. So I... I I like to look up words. I like to go on the, into the dictionary. And it says, not deterred by danger or pain to be brave. And there's a great worship song, song about um, you make me brave. Oh, I love that worship song. If, if you haven't heard that, maybe you could YouTube it after. Uh, you make me brave. So we sometimes are full of fear because the world can be scary. Life can be overwhelming and challenging. But we can have courage, and it's important to ask God for help with us becoming more brave, being more courageous, and to trust him. I think that's what it really comes down to, is trusting him. All through the Bible, there's amazing stories of men and women who I'm sure they were scared, but they trusted God, and it worked out in their favor. So are you fearing something? Are you worried all the time about a specific thing or maybe a whole bunch of things. Start praying about having more courage just to face things, trusting God with them. All right, let's move on. Um, oh, no, let's do one more about courage. This is a great one. Joshua chapter one, the Lord's charge to Jos Joshua. After the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua. He said, Moses my, Moses, my servant is dead. Therefore, the time has come for you to lead these people, the Israelites, across the Jordan River into the land I am giving them. So Moses, the one who freed all these people from uh, their, their captor, from the Pharaoh in Egypt, uh, he's, he's taking them to the promised land, but they're not there yet. And Moses is old and Moses died. And so who's going to take over? The next one in charge. Joshua is faithful. He worked with Moses. Now it's recorded in this book, God speaking to Joshua and he's saying this to him. And these stories, sometimes we can uh, gleam a little wisdom from these stories and be, be inspired by them. So what does he say about courage? He said, uh, for I am with you as I was with Moses. I will not fail you or abandon you. So I take that. I say, you know what? God was with Moses. God said he was going to be with Joshua. You know, if I'm faithful, I, I'm not boasting, but I believe God won't fail me and he won't abandon, and he won't abandon me. There's been many times where I felt like no one was with me, and but yet I knew God was with me. And so I pray that you... You just take some um, encouragement from these stories. Then it goes on to say, now this is really cool. Again, we're in Joshua chapter 1, verse 6. Be strong and courageous. This is recorded as God speaking to Joshua. He says, be strong and courageous, for you are the one who will lead these people to possess all the land I swore to their ancestors I would give them. Then he says this in verse 7. Be strong and very courageous. <laughs> you want to make sure Joshua is listen. Be courageous. Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Do not deviate from them. 
turning either to the right or the left, then you will be successful in everything you do. I love this one because we started this whole uh, 21 part series, seven week series with uh, studying the Bible. And it says here in verse eight, study this book of instruction continually, meaning study the scriptures, meditate it, meditate on it day and night so that you'll be sure to obey everything written in it. In other words, don't just read it. Really think about it. Meditate on it. He says, only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. And then he says this, and this is, if, if God repeats himself, listen, if he re repeats himself three times, I think we should be paying attention to this. He says to Joshua, this is my command. Be strong and courageous. He says courageous. Be be strong, courageous, three times. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Isn't that awesome? What a powerful, powerful story. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Be on guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. And do everything with love. I think I put that one in there last because I think that's, really a big part of our church. We are a church where we take studying the Bible very seriously. I mean, we, we check everything we do up against the Word of God. But we are careful to make sure that we don't lord it over people or our, our, our wisdom or our power to control people. We do everything with love. And I've been around Christians that they know a lot of scripture and they use it to abuse people and make them do tasks. And uh, it just it's, it breaks my heart. You know, God, he wants us to love people. And, you know, Jesus said, I didn't come to be served. I came to what? Serve people. So if Jesus came to serve people, I think we as Christians should be taking all this wisdom that we get from studying the Bible and seeing how we can best serve other people. Give what we have received away to somebody else. Be a blessing to somebody. And that's really what I was talking about yesterday, about not uh, at church. I was preaching um, waiting for Superman. Don't wait for Superman. <laughs> Superman may not come. And that's an amazing documentary if you want to watch a, a documentary about American education. Uh, side note, uh, waiting for Superman. Mind-blowing. It'll, it'll just really open your eyes to how many kids really need, um, you know, great teachers and school systems to help them through because sometimes they just don't have enough support. Um, anyway, so that, that's a side note. But we too, we can get so wrapped up and like, God, come save me, come save me. When really he's saying, I've given you the tools, be strong and courageous, push through. I'm telling you, I'll be there for you. I won't abandon you. And then the other point is, Sometimes we as Christians got to surround our friends, our brothers and sisters in Christ in the faith and say, hey, I know, I know it's hard. I know it seems like you can't do it, but we're there for you. In love, we're going to help you. And that's how we give our life away to others. Romans, oh, now we're going to talk about sin. <laughs> I went into that like, oh, here we go. The exciting, you know, sin is not something that anybody wants to talk about. But I want to show you, as a, as a father doesn't want their child to touch a hot oven uh, and burn themselves, God does not want you to sin, not because he's a, just all about the rules. It's because he cares for you. He loves you, and he wants to help you to not get burned. And uh, let's see what it says in Romans chapter 3, verse 21. God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law, as was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. And this is, here we go. This is truth right here. We talk about meditating on the word of God. We should be meditating on this every once in a while. Every one of these 21 subjects, I encourage people, meditate on them every so often and see where you're at. And just like my guitars, I'm looking at my guitars in the room here. 
they all need to be tuned. I picked up a guitar the other day, every single six strings all out of tune. I hadn't played it, that particular, particular guitar, in a few weeks. And just by sitting, it went out of tune. All right. For everyone has sinned, Romans says. Everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard, yet God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Jesus Christ when he freed us from the penalty of sins. For God presented Jesus as a sacrifice for sin. All right, so we've all sinned. Have you lied? Have you stolen something? Have you shown envy? A lot of those things. Sin. Um, have you kept the, the Sabbath day holy? A lot of people have a hard time with that one. Um, but that's a big one. You know, it's it's something that we have to look at and say, what is important to God? Uh, okay, he's given us the Ten Commandments. We should look at those and meditate on those. He's given us a lot of other uh, guidance and wisdom. But it says, for everyone has sinned. And so, you know, it's it's time that we say, God, I recognize what I've done wrong in your eyes. And I thank you, Jesus, for the sacrifice on the cross. And I repent of my sins, meaning I am choosing not to do that anymore. And I apologize for it. And God says, now I'm going to give you a clean record. So it's like going to court facing a prison sentence, and the judge say, you know what? I have mercy on you. I'm showing you grace. I'm going to throw all this out, and I'm going to do you one even better. I'm going to erase your record. That's pretty powerful. All right, 1 John 1, 5. This is the message we heard from Jesus and now declare to you. God is light, and there is no darkness in him at all. So we are lying if we say we have fellowship with God, but we are living in spiritual darkness. We are not practicing the truth. But if we are living in the light, as God is the light, is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Some people get caught up on the, what do you mean the blood of Jesus? In the Old Testament, people would bring an animal to sacrifice at the altar for what they did wrong. And there was all kinds of instructions. You know, if you caused, a, if you committed a big sin, it was a certain kind of animal. A small sin, it might be a smaller animal. It was all very detailed and organized. Then in the New Testament, Jesus was given to us not only to teach and preach and show us uh, how he could you know, do the miraculous. That was like his his proof. He would go around healing people and and proving that he really was the Messiah. But he went to the cross to be that final sacrifice. If you go to a synagogue today, they don't sacrifice animals at the local synagogue anymore. That's interesting to me um, because what changed that in history was the the life of Jesus. So over 2,000 years ago, things have you know changed. And um, and so we put our faith in the ultimate sacrifice, who is Jesus, and he cleanses us from all sin. I like what it says here in verse 6. Again, it's 1 John uh, chapter 1, verse 6. He says, um, we are lying if we say we have fellowship with God, but go on living in spiritual darkness. What is spiritual darkness? I think a lot of people are living in spiritual darkness, and, and that's sad. Um, I mean, I... I love, uh, one of the things I love so much about our church is that people are hungry to know the Word of God. They don't want to just come and hear a sermon and feel good and, and punch the clock and say, I went to church this week and I feel better. Generally, people at our church, they're hungry to learn more about the Word of God because that helps them to move out of spiritual darkness and into full awareness of what's happening both in the natural and in the supernatural. I just think that's wonderful. And so this might be new to you. Maybe you never even thought about that. Um, I, I went to church for many, many years and was never encouraged to, to get my own Bible and read it. At our church, I encourage everybody not only to get a Bible, but to get a study Bible and to read that Bible a lot. And I've, I've said, because I've heard it from others, that if you see somebody 
and their Bible is falling apart, it probably means they're not falling apart. You know what I mean? Like if you're using your Bible a lot and it eventually you know, the covers, you know, rip in and the pages are ripping. I opened my Bible on Sunday morning and a page almost, almost flew out when I was preparing because it totally ripped out. It was in the Gospel of Matthew. I've read that Gospel so many times. The pages are literally falling out. But I don't want to live in spiritual darkness. I think God gave us the, the word, the Bible. And, and so, you know, you're here. You're here tuning into this. You're hungry for, you know, more of God's word. So I'm not worried about you. Let's see what James chapter 4. I love the book of James. It's in the New Testament. James chapter 4, verse 7. So humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come close to God and he will come close to you. Now, let's break this down. This is one of my favorite scriptures. Humble yourself before God. Resist the devil. Humbling yourself before God is saying, saying, hey, God, I realize that you are over me, that you are father. I am son or daughter in your case. And you're saying, God, I recognize that you have a right way to live and you don't want me to get burned. You don't want me to live a life of regret. You want, as Jesus said, that we should follow him and he will lead us into green pastures, a life of freedom. And that, that's so beautiful. But the devil's going to try to get you. And it says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Well, how do you resist the devil? First of all, you recognize what is the devil and what is the devil's work. And by reading the word of God and by going to church and uh, getting into our, our times of praise and worship and life groups and fellowshipping with one another, building friendships, all of a sudden you start to realize there are two things at work in the world. There is God and there is the work of the devil. And you start to become wise to that. So when the devil starts to creep in again, you can say, ah, I know what that is. Nope, not having it. Uh, you know that when you start to get angry or bitter or jealous, all those things that just are not from God, you say, mm, nope, I know where that's coming from. I'm going to resist that and the devil will flee. It gets easier. So come close to God and God will come close to you. Some people say, I'm waiting on Superman, Max. Like I'm waiting for God to come and rescue me. When's he going to knock on my door? When's he going to call me? The Bible says, Come close to God, and then he will come close to you. I always wish it was the other way around, but that's how it's written. He wants you to reach out to him, and once you do, he will be there. He'll be there for you. All right, last one of the night. How are we doing? All right, a little bit more. Short one. Love. This is an easy one. We're going to finish this series on love. Now, if you've been to a wedding, you might have heard this being read, and here's where it's found. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Love is patient, love is kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable and it keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. I like this one. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. Now, what you could do is what I've done. You take 1 Corinthians 13 and you write down, love is patient on one line. And then number two, love is kind. Number three, love, and love is uh, not jealous. And you just keep going. And then every so often, how about uh, three, four times a year, every, every season, you grade yourself. When was the last time you got a report card? Some of you might be watching and you're young and you just got your report card. But when you get older, there's no report card. Sometimes I think it'd be good for us to get a report card and see how we're really doing and to be honest with ourselves. And what I do is I give myself a grade. And when it says love is patient, how did I do in the past three months with patience? And then I start to think, ah, I blew it there. I blew it over there. Ah, I came through over there better than I used to uh, deal with that you know, person or situation. And you just get real with yourself and you get real with God. And the goal is not to beat yourself up because we're not saved by works. We're saved by grace, but we should be evolving and, and just getting better. So I think that's a great practice to do. 
last page here, Colossians 3.12. Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Those are all things that we've we've seen in um uh was it Galatians chapter five, fruits of the Holy Spirit. We talked about that in another uh session. Then it says this. This is really helpful. You could use this one this week. Make allowances for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. <laughs> if no one's offended you this week, it's only Monday night. It might happen. So re- maybe maybe take a note. Colossians chapter three. Reread that one when somebody offends you. Um, it's make allowances for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. It's not easy, but I tell you, it's the right way. You know, I've never regretted taking the high road. Above all, clothe yourselves with what? We're talking about love. Clothe yourself with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. This is so beautiful. Let the message about Jesus in all its richness fill your lives. There's no, you know, it's not a surprise why I decided to end this course with the topic of love. Because if you will put into practice loving people and, and, and realize that God loves you, some, some of you are so hard on yourselves. The, the, the Bible says there's life and death in the tongue. I think a lot of people that you're just speaking so much negativity over your own self. Forget about everybody else. Start speaking love over yourself. God loves you. That's why he sent Jesus. God loves you and clothe yourself with love. Walk in love. Let it fill your life and you'll see your life is going to be a blessing to somebody who really could use some love. All right, so let's close with this this scripture. This scripture will really challenge me and I hope it challenges you because it's a good challenge. In the Gospel of John, chapter 13, verse 34, Jesus said, I am giving you a new commandment. Whoa, new commandment. I'm all ears. I want to hear what is Jesus going to say? A new commandment? He says, love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. And this is a discipleship course. The idea of this is that we want to be like Jesus's true followers, his disciples. Jesus picked 12 people to work with, like really, you know, together as a team for three years. His ministry on earth, he ministered to thousands, but he really poured his life into these 12. Why? Because he knew that one day he was going to the cross. He predicted it over and over again, proving that he really was the Messiah. And he said, you guys are going to carry on the work that I've shown you to do. In other words, you're going to take over. And they did. If you drive around New England where I am, there are churches all over the place. On every downtown corner, there's at least one, if not a couple even in small towns. That is all because those disciples took on the work of the ministry and spread the good news, the love of Jesus all around the earth. And we are called to keep that going. Amen? Amen. So if you missed any, I'm going to read to you all 21 and we'll we'll end with prayer. So the first week we we, we focus on how to study the Bible who is Jesus, and the topic of patience. The following week, we talked about prayer, attitude, oh, such an important thing. We have to always be checking our attitude, and humility. The third week, we talked about stress, peace, and the importance of rest. Then we talked about forgiveness, grace, and unity. Then worship, work, and money. Faith, discernment, the Holy Spirit, and tonight, courage, sin, and love. 
This is something I prayed about over the holidays, and I knew that we were supposed to have a discipleship course. And one night, I just got out a pen and paper, and I wrote all this down. And I'm so grateful that you took time uh, so that I could share it with you. And I pray that it continues to just help you with real life, all right? Because we all got to go out there and face real life. And hopefully, we can really walk in love and be a blessing to other people. Amen? All right. As always, if you need anything, let me know. Where are we going after this? Each Monday night, I'm going to go live at 730. And each week, it's going to be something fresh and different. I may be in different locations. I might be out in the woods, whatever. (laughs) But it'll be fun. And hopefully, it'll help us connect. Um, The church is open, but there's just a few people that have been showing up. And on Sunday mornings, most people are watching online. You do whatever you feel is best for you, whatever is safer for you. Um, and if you have any questions, go to elevationtoday.com and hopefully uh, you can get your answers there. Or reach out to me, email me, pastormax at yahoo.com. All right, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for tonight. We thank you, Lord, for our life. We thank you, Lord, for the challenge that the Word of God presents to us. And Lord, I pray that each one of us would accept the challenge to really walk with a greater understanding of who you are, God. I pray that each one of us would say, God, we want to draw closer to you. And God, we want you to become closer to us. God, we want to have courage. Lord, we want to deal with our sin. And God, we want to walk in the love that you have shown us to walk in. And God, I pray, Lord, you help us all to have a good night's sleep tonight with peace in our hearts that surpasses understanding. No matter what we're dealing with, Lord, I pray that we can put it in your hands tonight and have a good night of sleep. Amen.